a gentleman comes to Jesus and he says, Good master, what must I do to be saved? And uh, what Jesus tells him uh, does not resemble what you might hear someone tell someone today. And so therefore, there's some questions that we have to ask is, uh, has, has the way of salvation changed or does it change? Uh, does it, is it different for various time periods? And that's one of the questions that we have to ask. And then the other thing that we have to ask is, who is the judge of salvation? Who is the judge? Do we have the privilege or the right to judge someone's salvation? Um, and um, I'm going to share with you uh, some of the things that I have found in the scripture as we move uh, into these studies. Uh, there are folk that tell that there's, a, there's a, a various thoughts about salvation. There, there are some that will tell people that uh, uh, all you have to do is just believe and you can be saved. And then some will say if you believe and, you're con and you confess, you can be saved. Then some say if you uh, believe, confess, repent, then you're saved. Then some say if you uh, believe, confess, repent, and then be baptized, you're saved. Then some say that if you uh, believe, confess, repent, baptize, uh, receive a manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, then you're saved. And then there's some people that say that if you uh, believe, confess, repent, baptize, receive a, a, a uh, physical manifestation of the Holy Ghost, uh, and after which live a holy life, then you're saved. And then there are those that say that if you believe, if you confess, if you repent, if you are baptized, if you receive a physical manifestation of the Holy Ghost, if you live a holy life, and if you, uh, when Jesus comes, then you're saved. So we have all these variations uh, dealing with salvation. And, and because of that, many people are somewhat confused. And so I, I want to uh, look at certain things uh, and just kind of give you some things to think about as we get into this study. First of all, I want you to understand that many times the, the physical and the spiritual kind of run parallel. The physical and the spiritual run parallel. And uh, when we talk about salvation, uh, there are some things that we say in the physical that we change when it comes to the spiritual. Give you an example. There's an argument today as to when a, a child is uh, actually a child. Some people say, well, no, it's not really a baby until after it's born. It's not a baby, so therefore we can treat it any kind of way, do anything with it. We can dispose of it. You know, it's just a fetus. Okay, now one of the problems is that the fetus is not in the Bible, but there's some things that are in the Bible. I, I can recall uh, one place uh, in the book of Jeremiah, I believe it is, he says that when I, when I was in my, before I was in my mother's womb, you knew me. Mm. You knew me. Okay. Now some people say life does not, you know, it's, it's not really a baby until after it has a certain form. Okay. And so again, we're going to have to look at the scriptures and see what thus saith the scriptures. Um, but before we get into it, I do want to share something with you from a natural standpoint. Uh, when, a, when a woman gets pregnant, uh, one of the things that's difficult for you to do in the initial stage of her pregnancy is tell her that she is pregnant or to tell her that she is not pregnant. Mm -hmm. There are times when she has gotten pregnant that she's not aware that she is pregnant until certain things happen. Will you concur with that? Is that true? Okay. Now, let's, let's talk about a woman getting pregnant. When a woman gets pregnant, there's, there's usually uh, what they call trimesters that she has to go through. There's three trimesters, okay? And they say that the most important trimester, and the, the nurse can help me out if I get off track, that, that the most important trimester is the first trimester. And that is uh, from the time of conception until about the uh, 13th, like 13th week, okay? And then uh, you have the second trimester, 
uh, that runs from that uh, 13th week into the 24th week. And then you have the third trimester that runs from the 24th to the 40th week, okay? Uh, and it's amazing about this, uh, this, this number 40. How long was Jesus in the wilderness? 40, 40 days. How long was the children of Israel uh, in the wilderness? 40 years. 40, 40, 40 years in the wilderness. Now, I want you to understand that even with the children of Israel, uh, and, and, and this is kind of the way I uh, share salvation with people. You're saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. Okay? Now, let, let's, let's kind of go back and, and, and talk about some things first before we jump into the New Testament salvation. When the children of Israel uh, came out of Egypt, were they saved? Yeah, they were saved. They came out of Egypt. They were, they were saved from Egypt. They were out of Egypt, and, and then, then they, uh, uh, after they came out of Egypt, then they were baptized. He said, baptized, yes, yes. The Bible says they were baptized unto Moses in the Red Sea, right? Yes. Okay, were they saved then? Yes, yes. Because he said, the Egyptians that you saw, you, will, you won't see them ever again, no more. Okay, it says it's something like that in a double negative. You know, to really express, you're not going to see these guys anymore. So they're saved, right? But they're not in the promised land yet. They go through a wilderness experience. But are they saved? Well, they're saved from Egypt. They're saved from the pursuit of Pharaoh uh, and his army by way of the Red Sea. But they still have not entered into the promised land. So we can say that they have been saved and that they're being saved. And then when they get to the promised land, they can say, we're here, we're saved. Does that make sense? Okay. But guess what? There's another baptism that they, uh, in, that they uh, come involved with. I was going to say endure, but you don't endure baptism. Uh, and that's when they get to the Jordan River. They're baptized again in the Jordan. They have to pass through the Jordan River. Now, wait a minute. Are they saved yet? Well, now they're, now that's, you, 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 you have to go through the Red Sea. First of all, you got to get out of Egypt. Okay? You got to get out of Egypt. You got to be free from Egypt. Now, what was it that freed them from Egypt? Okay? Glad you asked. The Word. You remember? Moses received the Word from the burning bush, which was God. And then Moses took that Word, delivered it to Pharaoh and to the children of Israel. So it wasn't until they received the word of God. Now, they can't just receive it, but they have to receive it willingly. Okay, I'm trying to lay some groundwork. Okay. The first time they received it, they said, now wait a minute, who is this God that we should obey him? And then they hear the word of God again, but this time it is after Moses has delivered the word of God to Pharaoh, and when Moses delivers the word of God to Pharaoh, instead of Pharaoh saying, oh yeah, I'm going to let him go. You know what Pharaoh says? He said, I don't know God. I don't know this guy. Why should I let y'all go? I don't know him. Well, this, this is the whole purpose of the word of God is to introduce you to the God of the universe. And, to, and for those that want to be saved, to introduce you to the God of your salvation. So Pharaoh says, I don't know, I don't know him. Well, after God takes him through a few things, not only does he know him, but he's willing to do what God says, at least for a moment. Okay. Now, I, I, want, I want to show you something. Uh, even, even Pharaoh got saved for a second. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. He got saved for a second. The word salvation deals with deliverance. And so he got delivered from the judgment of God just for a second. When he, when he repented, when he changed his mind, mm -hmm. God stopped judgment. The last thing God did was to kill all the children, the firstborn in Egypt. He killed the firstborn. That was judgment. You know what? After that, Pharaoh said, you know what? I changed my mind. Y'all get up out of here. So now Pharaoh repents. Okay. But the problem is, is that when, when the word of God does not find an anchor in your heart, your repentance can be short. Anybody ever seen somebody have short-term repentance? Some people call it jailhouse repentance. Yeah, uh, you know. You know, <laughs> mama done died in repentance, you know. Uh, I'm in real bad trouble, need your help, Lord, repentance, you know. And we, we uh, and a lot of times when that happens, we are sincere. 
at that moment. Okay. But then because the word of God does not, is not lodged and anchored in us, uh, we don't keep that repentance. We go back to our old mindset. We go back to our old mindset. Now understand, Moses was preaching to Pharaoh all this time, and finally it got through. He finally got through. But see, Moses wasn't there to continually preach to Pharaoh because he had an assignment, and that was to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now, they hear the word of God, and they're excited because they're ready to leave. They're ready to get up out of sin. I'm going to show you uh, in a little bit that even they don't hold to the word of God. Even they don't hold to the word of God. I'm trying to shorten this for you uh, by giving you the Old Testament story so we're going to turn from Scripture to Scripture. I guess we can do that a little bit later. But I'm trying to get you to the New Testament so we can talk about the present day salvation. Okay, so they are delivered from Egypt, so they're saved. They're, 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 they're going through the uh, wilderness, so they're being saved. And when they get to the promised land, they can say, we are here. We have made it. To a degree, they will have deliverance. Total deliverance from the Egyptians. Total deliverance from them. But for them to have total deliverance, they have to go through a process. It's not, I say I'm saved. I receive, I receive God's word, and I'm saved. No, yes, that's initial salvation. But that is not your complete salvation. Okay. And the Bible is, is big on talking about us enduring until the end. Some people say, well, as soon as you say, you say, you say, and you can never lose your salvation. Well, we're going to check that out too. I guess we should look at some of that, right? We need to put that, that dog to rest before we move forward. Let's look there in the book of uh, Corinthians. Book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, we're going to show you some people that were saved. But even after they were saved, they got lost. First Corinthians chapter number 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. And verse number 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Now see, he, he, that means I want you to know. I want you to know how this works. He says, How that all our fathers were under the cloud. That's, that's baptism. And passed through the sea, that's baptism, okay? The cloud and the sea. Now, this represents a, a, a physical water baptism, and it also represents the spiritual baptism, okay? Now, these, these two things are two components of one baptism. They are two components of one baptism. It says, and, and were all baptized unto Moses. So they were baptized in the name of Moses. That was the saving name. In the, in the Old Testament was Moses. And, and, and in the cloud and in the sea. Okay? And it says, and all and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Now, so, so now they have to not only be baptized, but they also have to eat the spiritual meat. They have to, they have to now they've received the word of God earlier, and that's what got them to the point that they are now. But after, after this, they still have to receive spiritual nourishment if they're going to continue to be saved. Now watch what it says. And they, they, they all drink that same spiritual drink. Uh, now again, this is talking about uh, continuously having the Spirit of God. When we get to the New Testament, it's going to talk about, uh, in the book of St. John, Jesus says, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. So again, this is about drinking. So Now, now let me ask you something. How often are you, should you drink? Every day. Now, I know y'all know the answer. If, if y'all can't tell me, I'm going to go to Community Spirit because they'll give me the right answer. Every day. Every day. Every day. Every day. <laughs> they'll, tell, they'll tell me every day, every, every chance you get, you ought to drink. Yes. Yeah. You ought to drink. Every, yeah. They're kind, they're kind of like my, uh, my uncle. I had an uncle. He's passed away, so he won't mind me saying this. And uh, he, he told me, nephew, he said, I know you've heard rumors about me. He said, people say that I drink all the time. He said, I don't. I don't drink all the time. He said, there's only two times I drink. He said, when I'm with somebody, when I'm by myself. <laughs> so, in other words, okay. And so, the Lord wants us to continually, continually drink. Okay? It says, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, wait a minute. That rock was Christ? So, Christ is in the Old Testament? Yes, he is. You mean it's not another God? No, it's not. It is Christ, Him. Wait a minute, I thought that was God the Father. What did this say it was Christ? 
So now you don't have to guess. Now you know. See, the thing about the Bible, you don't have to guess about stuff. If you read enough, it'll tell you what you want to know. Yes. And you don't have to argue. Listen to what it says. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. Wait a minute. He wasn't pleased with them after he saved them out of Egypt. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. While they were on their way to final salvation, they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, who overthrew them? And don't tell me he's saved because he didn't. A lot of times we blame stuff on the devil. You know, sometimes you have to feel, well, I would say feel sorry for him, but I can't say that. But, you know, I mean, come on, we blame everything on the devil. If I did this, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. That, no, you chose to do it. Yes. You made a choice. Yes. And one of the main choices that we make that, that uh, 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 send us to a place we call the land of backslide is murmur and complain. Murmur, that's the beginning of backsliding, murmur, murmuring and complaining, okay? The Bible says that all things give thanks, yes. okay? So that means, should we ever murmur? Mm -hmm. No. Should we ever complain? Mm -hmm. No. So if we're murmuring and complaining, we can, we can say that we have slid back a little bit, all right? Look what it says. It says, now these things were our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye adulterers, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And so what, what got them off the track of salvation? So again, I'm trying to show you that what happened in the Old Testament is going to happen again in the New Testament. What got them off of the track of salvation? Well, he tells us they were eating, they were drinking, and they were playing. They got themselves involved in what was pleasurable to the flesh to the extent that they forgot what was good for the spirit. And, and that's what happens today uh, in the time that we live in. People are so busy doing what feels good that they don't do what is good. All right? It says, neither let us let commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Now, let's talk about the fornication that he's talking about. This fornication that they did, uh, this is where they were trying to have the same relationship with a strange God as they were with the true and living God. Y'all remember uh, Moses uh, went up uh, to the mountain uh, to get some tablets and spend some time with God. And uh, while he's doing this, this is amazing. You know, while he's trying to spend time with God, the people go to hell in a handbasket. They, 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 they say, where's he at? He, he, he's been gone too long. We, we need some gods to worship. <laughs> and so instead of worshiping the true and living God, they uh, uh, commandeer Aaron and say, we, we need you to make us a God like the one we had uh, back in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he began to, to make a God out of the gold that they had. Now I understand, God had, now see this is another uh, area of backsliding. God has plans for what he's blessed you with. Okay. Remember when they left out of Egypt? Mm -hmm. He tells them to, to get gold and silver from your neighbors. Your, your Bible says borrow. Okay. Now usually when you borrow something, you're going to give it back. They weren't planning on giving it back. Okay. Because and God didn't mean for them to give it back because he said they weren't going back ever again no more. So how can you give it back? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that particular borrow ain't borrow as in give it back. Okay. That, that, okay. So, so but, but when God tells you to borrow it, he doesn't have you to borrow it for you to heap it on you. Mm -hmm. He has you to borrow it for you to say, okay, God, now that I have it, what would you like me to do with this that you have blessed me with? Okay. And so what they do is they begin to build a calf. Now, wait a minute. When you start reading the scripture, you'll find out that God had plans for this in the in Exodus, the 25th chapter. God had plans for this. He said, I had this, this, this was, I had plans for this for my house. This was going to be my, for my stuff. But he can't use it for his stuff if you're using it for your stuff. Amen. And so that's what we do. We put God second and we come first. My God. But he said, I shall have you. Don't put any other God before me. And he means not even you. Amen. You don't even put you before him. Because at that point, you become God. And God's a jealous God. So anyway, they make this calf. And now, guess what? They're dancing. They're partying. They're having a good time, but they're doing it all in the name of worship, but they're worshiping the wrong God. So, so again, this is, 
you can see backsliding begin to, to happen. All right, look there. Uh, look what it says. Neither, neither let us commit fornication. Some of them committed and fell in one day. Three and twenty thousand. Three and twenty. That's a lot of people. It says, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed of the serpent. Now, wait a minute. I thought they got saved out of Egypt. They did. I thought they made it across the Red Sea. They did. But God destroyed them in the wilderness. Now, look what it says. Verse 10. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, what did, what got them destroyed? Murmur. Murmur. Wait a minute. I would have thought that, you know, it's because they were cutting each other, knifing each other. I would have thought it was really because of the fornication. But no, it says because of their mur murmur is something else. That's why in the New Testament, when we get to the New Testament, uh, there was some murmuring going on about the, the fifth and sixth chapter of the book of Acts. And they said, hey, Y'all get us some deacons, some, some, some folk that can go and, and, and squash this murmuring stuff. Because this is the quickest way to get God's judgment is to show God that we're murmuring and complaining. See, instead of murmuring, we're supposed to be praising. Now look what it says. This is the part I want. Now all these things happen unto them for in examples. And they are written for our, that's me and you, our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Wait a minute. Just because you think you say look around and see if your behavior is matching up with what you is, is your profession and your possession matching up with one another. And if it's not, you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself as the young kids would say. Mm -hmm. You ever see somebody thought they were looking just I mean, uh, looking sharp, looking good. And you looked at them, and you know, either the tie is crooked or, or their hair is a hot mess, but they think they're looking good. See, sometimes you got to check in the mirror to see if I'm where I'm supposed to be or if it's just, just me. All right, let's look what it says. Verse 13, there had no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful. See, God is not trying to, he's not trying to kill you. He's trying to get you saved. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Okay, we got to look at this just for a second. So this talks about us being saved and stay, staying saved. So Satan's job is to bring things to us that will draw us away from God. And so this was done in the fourth chapter. Of the, of the gospel of St. Luke when he takes Jesus upon the pinnacle. Okay? And so what happens is before, before Satan can tempt you, he has to run whatever he's going to do by God so that God can determine whether or not if you chose to, can you handle this. So there's never a time that you just can't handle it. Yes, you can. If God said it, if God allowed it, See, Satan may have said it, but God is God that allowed it, so that means you can handle it. So when Satan brings it, the Bible says that God makes a way out so that you can escape. So that you can escape. So it, it doesn't matter. All right, so now we're, we're talking about this thing about say, say, being saved so that we can be saved. So let's go back to a conversation uh, that was had between uh, Jesus and a man by the name of Nicodemus. In the Gospel according to St. John, chapter number 3. St. John, chapter number 3. And if you look there, chapter 3, verse number 1 says, And there was a man of the Pharisees, named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. In other words, he was a leader of the Jews. How many of y'all know you got to pray for your leaders because they don't know everything? Yes, Lord. I, I don't care if, if he wants to make you think he does. He doesn't. That's why you have to pray for him. It says, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man 
can do these miracles that thou dost except God be with him. Now, for a moment, let's, let's talk about Nicodemus. Because a lot of people, uh, you know, we would judge Nicodemus today because Nicodemus realizes that Jesus has something that he needs. But because of the association that he has with other people, he dare not acknowledge this during the daytime. And so we talk about people. How come you have to, you, you're ashamed. You're just ashamed. No, no, no. Sometimes God has people that he wants to do things, wants them to do things the way they're doing things because he has a purpose for them. Some people are plants. We tell people, you know, if God did such and such front for you, you need to come out of this church. You need to come out. No, no. You need to find out what God wants you to do. Because God may have you where you're at as a plant. Okay. Listen to the conversation that they have. Verse number 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, how did Jesus jump off on this? Because he ain't said nothing yet. But see, Jesus knows the intents of his heart. He knows why this man is coming. So he's cut to the chase because I don't know how much time we're going to have to talk. So he cuts to the chase. He said, and look what Nicodemus says. Nicodemus says unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, he's asking this question because Nicodemus does not understand what Jesus is saying. And so he asks this question. And based on the fact that he asks this question, Jesus knows that he really wants, he's sincere. He really wants to know the answer. Look what Jesus said. Jesus answered and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So you have to be born of the water and of the Spirit, of the water and of the Spirit. Now, now a lot of times you hear people, when they talk about the Scripture, they tell people, see, unless you're baptized in water, you, you, you just love it. Okay, I want to submit to you that in this particular setting, he's not talking about H2O baptism. You say, well, how do you, how do you know? Let's read the next verse. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Now, Nicodemus, you're in the flesh, and you're asking me something about that which is spiritual. This is what he says. Marvel not that I say unto thee that ye must be born again. Now, he says you have to be born of water and you have to be born of spirit. Now, I know I told you that this water is not physical H2O, so I got to support, I got to bring you, give you some scripture to support that. Okay? So if you would keep your finger where it's at and join me in the book of Ephesians. Join me in the book of Ephesians. Now, let me ask you a question. What is, what is it that God is trying to do for us? He's trying to show us in, in chapter 3 the way of salvation, right? Mm -hmm. will, you, will you agree with that? Yes. Okay, okay. Now, he also does that in type with the relationship of the husband and the wife. He does it in type. And let's look, let's look what he says. Uh, let's look at Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 21. He says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. So now, now this is telling us, if we're going to be saved, the first thing we have to do is submit ourselves unto the Lord. Nicodemus has to submit himself to the words that Jesus is getting ready to utter to him. He's got to submit himself to the word of God. Okay, now listen to what he says. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ, that's who Nicodemus is talking to, is the head of the church, and he's the what? Savior, Savior of the body. Now listen to what it says. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything. Husband loves your wife as Christ, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself 
for it. Now, here's the verse I want you to pay attention to. You can circle this if you want to. That he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing. Did, he, did I say washing? Mm -hmm. Did he say washing? Washing. Mm -hmm. Of the water by the what? Word. That's not H2O, is it? No. That's the washing of the water by the word. So he says you must be born of water, the word, and the spirit. Now let's go back and let's pick up the spirit portion of this. Let's go back to the book of St. John, chapter number 3. This is what he says in verse number uh, 7. Chapter 3 of St. John, verse 7. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Now, 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 now get this. Nicodemus is getting the word, right? But he's going to let Nicodemus know, even though you're receiving the words that I say, there's another component to this. And the, 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 the next component, you're, you're hearing the word. The Bible says, how shall they hear without a preacher? In this case, who's the preacher? Jesus. How shall he preach except he be sent? Jesus was sent, and he testifies that he was sent. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, now let's listen to what he says. Now he's going to talk about the, 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 the being born of the Spirit. He says, the wind bloweth where it lists, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell from whence it come or where it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now, Nick still don't get this. Nicodemus don't get this. Nicodemus answers and says unto them, how can these things be? He says, I, I'm really not getting this. Jesus understands he's not getting it. What he's saying is stick, stick, stick. See, again, this is a sample to us. We think every time, just because somebody sits in these seats and hears the preacher preach the word, that they automatically understand what's being said and they, they ought to immediately come up and get saved. Sometimes they're sitting there, they're hearing the word, but they don't understand the word. And until they really understand the word, it makes it hard for them to act upon the word. And you can't make somebody understand the word. The understanding has to be given by God. You can have people sitting in the church four or five years and they still not understand what they hear. They don't understand what they read. Let me prove it to you. Um, let's go to the book of uh, Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter number 8. See, so you, you got people that well, I, 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 I've been to Sunday school all my life. Well, because you've been to Sunday school all your life don't mean you understand what you've been listening to in Sunday school. It just means you've been there. Just keep going. It's good. Keep going. All right. In the eighth chapter of the book of Acts. Now, listen. This, this, this guy is going to have to get a preacher to come and help him understand. Uh, Let's, let's go to verse number 26 so we can look at this text in context. Verse 26 says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, unto Gaza, which is what? The desert. Desert. Now, wait a minute. God is telling his preacher, I want you to go down into the desert. He missed it. If I was going to pick somewhere to preach, it would not be the desert. Mm -hmm. Okay? But here's the deal. You don't get to pick. God picks. I know it's different than the preachers today. Preachers today, they pick where they're going to preach. First question is, how much is the honorarium? Mm -hmm. How much can you send me up front? Mm -hmm. And this is what I want after I get there. No, I can't go there because they ain't have no money. They, they, they got, I, I, I ain't going there. You're picking. What you got to do is you let, he's supposed to send you, you're supposed, as a servant, you go where he sends you. You don't go where you choose. This ain't, that ain't supposed to be a vacation. Mm -hmm. You're on assignment. You have a mission. Most people, they, most people want to do what they want to do. 
And because we're so busy doing what we want to do, the people that God has determined needs to hear the word from our mouth don't get to hear it because we, instead of serving God, we all have a vacation. Well, I'm going to go there. We have a good time. Well, who told you to go have a good time? You're supposed to go and serve the Lord with gladness, no matter where you're at. But see, most people, you know, if they go somewhere that God has sent them and they don't like it, you would think the scripture says serve the Lord with sadness. Because that's what they do. Okay. Let's look what it says. Verse 27 says, And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Now, this man is somebody. Now, you would, would you have expected to see somebody in the desert? He is a somebody. <laughs> see, God knew where this somebody was. And that's why he sent him there. Notice it says, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So this man came for the right reason, but he was worshiping, shall I say, without, without having all the information. And there's some people that are out there, they are worshiping God to the extent that they know how to worship. And you can't take that from them. God honors that. And because they're doing that, God will send them more. Watch this. And she, he says he was returning and sitting in the chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. Now this lets you know he had some money. Because back then you didn't have no scripture unless you had some money. That scripture, you know, because it's handwritten. And for you to be running around with a scroll, you are somebody and you have some money. So God is even concerned about the rich. Aren't you, aren't you ladies concerned about the rich? Amen. Amen. It says, then the Spirit said unto, wait a minute. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, see, that's, what we have, that's why we got to seek God, so that we can hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Spirit says, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither uh, to him, and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, he said, Un understandeth thou what thou read? He said, hey, he's asking this Ethiopian, he said, do you understand what you're reading? Now, he's been, now wait a minute, he's educated. He's a, he's a treasurer. He can think. He can add. He, but he still don't understand what he's reading. And he said unto him, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he should come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. It says in his humiliation the judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the human answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Is he talking about himself? Or some other man? He said, I really want to know. Now he's been worshiping God. But he really don't know God yet. But he's been worshiping, he's been doing the best he can with what he has. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see here's water. What doth here to be to be baptized? Now, evidently, when you read verse number 36, somewhere between verse number 35 and verse number 36, the subject of being saved, how do I be saved, came up. And Philip said, glad you asked. Let me tell you. You, 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 believe, in Bible, you believe about Jesus, right? You believe about Jesus, yes. You, you're, you're ready. You're ready. You're, this, this man don't have to turn. He don't have to repent. He, he's already headed in the right direction. He says, are you ready to be baptized? Are you ready to go further? Are you ready for this? Are you ready to be baptized and receive God's spirit? He says, look what he says. And Philip said, he said, what's, what's hindering me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believe with all your heart. See, I told you. He said, do you believe with all your heart? And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So here we go. You say you believe. What is it that you believe? Now, what you have to believe is what I've been preaching. Now, what should I be preaching? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the, that is the gospel message, and he's here to save you. Now, folk that are preaching all this other stuff, and it don't include Jesus Christ being the Son of God that has come to save us, you're, not, you're preaching another gospel. 
Now, does it sound good? Yes. Does it feel good? Yes. But will it have good results? Not eternally. Not eternally. So this, he's had this discussion with it. Now, look what happens. Verse number 38, and he commands the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water. Now, I know some people say, well, it ain't that water ain't necessary. Well, if it wasn't necessary, why did they get off the chariot? Just think about being wet. That's enough. No. They get off the chariot, and they both of them go down into the water. Why are they both going down into the water? You know, back in the old days when you buried somebody, you had to get down in the ditch, because that's the only way you could dig it is get down in there. Okay? And so you so so the same same things happen. Philip is down in the water with this man. Okay? And so he's gonna he's gonna take him down. Now this this baptism is a representation of burial, being buried with him. Okay? That's why that's why when they take you down, they cover all of you. They don't they don't sprinkle you, they don't spit on you, they don't, aren't you glad? Amen. They don't pull the water on you. They take you and they dunk you down in the water. Amen. So I can't get to church, can't get a pool, get a tub, don't matter. Look what it says. Verse 39, and when they were, watch this. Verse 38, I'm sorry. And he commanded the chair to stand still, and they went both into the water, both Philip and the unit, and he baptized him. Baptism, that, that's taken from a word called baptizos, which means to totally submerge, not ratizos, which means to get a little wet, a little sprinkle. And see, that's the problem. A lot of people get a little spiritual wet. They get a little spiritual wet. Now, you know what happens when you get a person a little spiritual wet? Instead of doing them good, you do them bad. Okay. You ever had just enough water to make you smell? No, if you don't get enough water, no, if you get just a little bit of water on a, on a body and it's not enough to cleanse it, it's enough just to wake up the stink that's already there. <laughs> that's what happens. That's why you got to get it all. That's why you got to get totally baptized. It says, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. He said, I got what I came for. Because he received the word of God. And he received the spirit of God. Now, how do we know that he received the spirit of God? If we read the text in context, that, that means we have to go back into the same chapter number 8 and see what happens. Now again, this is going to tell us the process of salvation. Okay, This is going to tell us. Look there in the 8th chapter. And uh, let's see here. Let's let's come all the way down to uh, verse twelve of the eighth chapter. It says, "But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ." Now wait a minute. The things of the kingdom of God. And the name of Jesus Christ. Now, now, what, what, what do you think he's talking about when he says about the name of Jesus Christ? The Son of God. He's, he's telling them what, again, the gospel, who Jesus is, what he came for, mm -hmm. and as a result of that, uh, as a result of this, they must have had a discussion about how can I enter into the kingdom of God? How can I be saved? And let's see what it says. And they were what? This is baptized stuff again. And they were baptized, both men and women. There's no difference. Men and women. Both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And he was baptized. Now wait a minute. Who is Simon? When we go up above here, we, uh, the Bible tells us that Simon was one who had been hanging out with folk. Maybe he was bewitching some folk. And some folk Build him up to be some great man of God because of the, the, the sorcery that he did. Listen, he heard the word of God. And for a moment, it messed him up. Yeah. But watch this, he's going to backslide. There's some people that come in, hear the word of God, it really shakes them and disturbs them. But because they're not anchored, they will go back and think what they thought before they heard the word of God. Look what it says. Then Simon, verse 13, then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued. Wait a minute, he was baptized too? Yes. He continued with Philip, wondering and beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. 
Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that the Samaritan, that, or that Samaria had received the word of God. Now wait a minute. What did they do? Received. They received the word of God. What is this? This is the washing with the word. They have been washed with the word of God. It didn't, it didn't say that they heard the word of God. They received it. That means they accepted the word of God. The word of God is working on it. It's washing it. Okay. Well, look. So this is part one of a two-part deal. They heard that Samaria had received the word of God. They sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now, wait a minute. That they might receive the Holy Ghost? Okay, now, now, now we have to distinguish some things we do. Is it possible for someone, and I want you to think about this, this is kind of a rhetorical question, you have to answer for yourself, for someone to have the Spirit of God, but yet not be baptized by the Spirit of God? Is it possible for someone to have the Spirit of God? And I know this is a controversial thing to say. Is it possible for somebody to have the Spirit of God but not be filled with the Spirit of God? Yes. To have it, but not have it to the extent that it's flowing out like living water. No, no, so understand something. For it to flow out. When you know the Bible says, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. It has to be in there. For it to flow out, it has to be in. That's right. Nothing flows out that ain't in. That's right. It has to well up. It has to, you have to stir up the, the gift. You have to stir up the gift. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, I used to like to watch, uh, you know, I used to, I still do, uh, like to watch a pop being poured. Because when you, when you pour it, it gets that little foam and the foam starts running all along, you know, and then you, you know, you're just tempted to just, you know, suck up, y'all excuse me. You want to suck all the foam up and then it goes back down. Mm -hmm. And then you pour it again, let it rise up, and you <laughs> start that process all over again until, it, until it's totally filled up. I want you to think about this because, again, we're, this is kind of more or less an introductory. Okay, I bet you probably say it's a long introductory. Okay. I would say I'm sorry, but I'm not. Okay. Listen to what this says. He's going to pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now, I, I want to submit to you when it says the Holy Ghost here, it's talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, wait a minute. But they've already received the Word. They've already been in civic. There's already been, there's already been a, if you will allow me, there's already been a conception. There's already been an insemination. But now, after this, listen. Insemination and manifestation is two different things. Mm -hmm. When a woman is inseminated, it, you have to wait for the manifestation of the insemination. But there should be a manifestation of insemination. Is, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope y'all follow me. Listen to what he says. Verse number 16, For as yet he was falling up on none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, they had received the word of God. They made a determination in their minds, we're going to repent, we're going this way. And now they are seeking the Lord for more of him. They're seeking the Lord or they're waiting to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. It says, verse 17, then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Now, there's a visible something that occurs. Now, how do we know this? Look at verse number 18. And when Philip saw, so Philip sees something, that through the laying on of hands of the apostles, or through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered some money. He <laughs> said, boy, I want to do that. How much it costs? I want to sign up. Aren't you glad that the Spirit of God ain't something that money can buy? Because yes. if it was, all the rich would live and all the poor would die. Lord, mm -hmm. Lord. Look what he says. Say, give, give, give unto me this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, 
he may receive the Holy Ghost. So there was something that he saw happen to let him know that these people had received something. This is the truth. Look what he says. But Peter said unto him, <laughs> Your money perish with you, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Mm. You can't get this with money. You can't buy it because this ain't a pocket thing. This is a heart thing. It ain't about your pocketbook. God don't care much about your pocketbook. He cares about your heart because when he watch this. When God has your heart, he got your pocketbook. My God. Mm. Yes. That's why some people can't give God no money because he ain't got their heart. I ain't giving that church my money. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't giving that man, that man up there my Listen, you ain't you ain't following my command, you're following God's command. That's the whole point. <laughs> He says, listen what he said. He said, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. For, for, thy, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Now wait a minute. He's come this far, but his heart ain't right. He said, you know what you forgot to do? I'm going to tell you. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. And pray God, if perhaps the thoughts of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Man. So again, it appears... That this thing of being saved is a thing of process. But again, people don't really understand unless we unless we share it. Let me, let me show you that people just don't understand. Just because they sit in the seat don't mean they understand. Look there in Luke chapter number 24. Now you would think that if you hung out with Jesus for about three years, you know all you need to know, wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, you know, you hang out with him, you know. It kind of, it's kind of funny. People are getting married and be married after five years and say, well, he ought to know me by now. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. After five years, really, come on, five years. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. He can stay with you another 15. He still ain't going to know you, okay? What about 50? Y'all know something about 50. How about 55? Do you really know him? Do you know, you don't know him. Come on. Can you read his mind? Can you read her mind? Y'all been together 55 years. Ain't you ought to be ashamed of yourself you can't read her mind by now. Listen, you ain't never going to read her mind. You ain't never going to know all that. <laughs> she, there's, some, there's some things that she has to reveal to you. Is that right? There's some things that, that, that they're not revealed, you not going to know. Let's look what it says. All right. Uh, let's, let's look at verse number uh, 44. You know, a lot of times when I teach this message, uh, I like to go up to uh, verse 41. I, I, I just share, I'm just throwing this in as a little extra, okay? I, I like to have fun. Is that okay? Okay, I'll I do it anyway. It says, And while they had believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? What he said, Y'all gonna take me out to lunch? See, he's the preacher. There's nothing wrong with feeding the preacher. Boy, ain't nobody said amen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they gave him a piece of raw fish and of a honeycomb. So they gave him fish and they gave him some honey. So it's all right to feed the preacher, right? Okay, ain't nobody said amen. Hey, I guess y'all look at some of these preachers. Now, we don't fed them too well. Okay. And he took it. And he did, he ate before them. He ate. And he, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. Now, ain't that something? He's talking to, he's talking to them over, over a meal. It's amazing how many things happen over a meal. With, when, his, <laughs> when his disciples, he said, I, I, I want to eat this meal with y'all. There's something about there's something about a fellowship of having a meal with somebody. See, generally in the Old Testament, you didn't. You, in the Bible time, you didn't eat with people you didn't like. You, Amen. <laughs> you understood? If, if I'm eating with you, you are not my enemy. Okay? You didn't eat with your enemy. Okay? Look what he says. He said, these things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. He says, all of this is about me. The law of Moses is about me. The prophets is about me. The Psalms is about me. Now watch this. Verse 45. They don't been with him for three years at least. He says, then opened he their understanding that they might understand this. All this time, they don't have understood the scriptures. There are people that sit in the seat Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. 
We want them there so they can hear the word. But until God comes by and quickens their understanding, they're just weeping. They don't, they ain't getting what you get. But you can't judge them because they're not getting what you get. Because there was a time when you didn't have it. There was a time when God had to open your understanding. So what do you do when you got somebody sitting in your congregation and they have no understanding? Well, you can't give it to them. What you have to do is pray for them. Amen. You're supposed to be praying. Wait a minute. Because God is trying to deliver some stuff. And sometimes what God is trying to, to deliver gets held up as Daniel. Daniel was praying. He said, Daniel, I heard you 21 days ago. Yeah. It got held up. Yeah. Lord, I don't understand. Stay right where you are because God has sent the understanding. You just can't move. You know, we see a song, when God gets ready, you got to move. That's when God gets ready, not when you're ready. Hmm. It said, wait a minute. And he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behoove Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and then he tells them what part you're going to play. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So you got to stay where you're at until you've been totally endued with power. Not, not the power that's given when somebody says we make you president. No. The power that comes from on high. And until you get that, sit still. Don't be in a hurry. The Bible says that he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them. Now wait a minute, and carried up to him. So what he's doing is, he's saying, okay, now one phase has ended. The only reason this phase is ended is so we can start the next phase. Wait a minute, there are phases in salvation? He says, and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Uh, amen. Hmm. Now, this is the process of salvation that's beginning. Now, remember, Jesus said, you got to come unto me and drink. What am I drinking? The Word. Yeah. The Word of God. I'm drinking the Word. Y'all y'all, done caught on. Man, y'all picking this up. Okay, let, let me see if I can get, get the scripture for this. Uh, turn to the seventh chapter of St. John. Seventh chapter of St. John. All right, seventh chapter, verse number 37. Seven and 37. It says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now, wait a minute. He's showing you the process. What are you drinking? The word. Let him come unto me and receive the word. That's what he's saying. And drink. Now, after you drink, after you receive the word, he says, He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, how is it that this living water, which is the Word of God, which is the Spirit of God, is flowing out? The only way that it's flowing out is because the Word of God has been planted in. Do you understand? The Word of God, this, this, these things, they go together. Let me show you real quick, and our time is almost up. Uh, in the 14th chapter of the book of St. Uh, St. John, 14th chapter, verse number 6. Jesus, and just in case I don't get there, verse number 6 and verse number 17. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the truth. But in verse 17, he says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, who's dwelling with them? Jesus. Jesus. Who's going to dwell in them? Jesus. Jesus. They have the word, then they're going to have the spirit. And it's all one of the same. 
Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, my time is up. And I thank you for yours. Amen. Do you have any questions? What was the last scripture you just read? I'm sorry, I was taking St. John chapter number 14. We looked at verse number 6. And we looked at verse number 17. Thank you. Okay, now, I hope somebody doesn't say this. See, he, he, he don't believe in water baptism. That ain't what I said. I, I'm saying you got to use the right scripture. And uh, third, uh, first, uh, St. John chapter 3 is not the right one. That is not the right one. Okay. You, you have to go to St. Mark. You can go to St. Matthew. You know, some of the other. But that ain't the one. Because that, that water that he's talking about in that is the washing of the water word not the we, we have made the mistake in many of the churches into being judges. We've set ourselves up to be judged. With what you just read, it says, and ye are witnesses. In Isaiah, it says, and ye are witnesses. I call you a witness. You're not called to judge anything or anybody. You are witnesses. Now, just like I cannot tell a woman that she ain't pregnant, so number one, I wasn't there. You can't tell nobody they ain't saved. I can't tell her that I can't tell somebody they ain't saved. That's right. The reason I can't is because there's some people that think they save according to Matthew chapter 7, verse number 20, 22. They think they save, but they ain't. And they think they're saved based on signs. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, the Bible doesn't say these signs shall follow them that are saved. It says, these signs shall follow them that are believed. That believe. Now you can believe and not believe as the scriptures have said and still have the signs. Mm -hmm. But he does say, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. By the love that you have one for